Welcome back, everybody, to the Rule Your Pool podcast. I'm Eric Knight. This is episode 10. We started with all sorts of other topics from pH and alkalinity to the LSI. And now this is the second of a two part series on the six costliest bad habits that we see in swimming pool maintenance. We have a guest host with us, Joe Swayze, our new sales manager at Arenda. Joe, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. If you've been listening to the podcast, Joe was with us on the last episode. And the real reason I wanted him on this episode in particular is because Joe has over 20 years experience in water testing. And that's one of the habits that we're going to talk about today. So it's really good to have Joe with us. Um, we're continuing on and doing the top three bad habits that are costing you money, time, stress, and effort. And um, let's just get right into it. So Without further ado, episode 10 of Rule Your Pool. Welcome to Rule Your Pool, the podcast by Arenda that explains and simplifies pool chemistry so that anybody, regardless of experience, can understand it. I'm your host, Eric Knight, bringing clarity to these subjects so that you can bring clarity to your water. If you're ready to rule your pool, then let's go. Okay. So when it comes to the cost of operating a swimming pool, um, there's a lot of things that are kind of hard to measure. If you are a business owner or a sole proprietor, maybe, and you just have a pool route, you may not be thinking about these things, but they add up over time. And, and the three takeaways from this episode are the exact same as the last episode, because it applies to all six of the habits. These habits are definitely costing you money. Whether you're measuring it or care about it is a different question. They may be small amounts, but the more pools you have, the bigger the cost. And so the more pools you have, the faster you're going to recognize the return on investment by breaking these habits and replacing them with a better habit. And correcting them, that's the beautiful part, it costs you nothing or, or next to nothing to correct these habits. So these are the top three problems that we see that lead to costly issues. So number three on the list, last episode, we did six, five, and four. Number three on the list, neglecting test kits. Joe, I'm going to put you on the hot seat because you're the test kit expert. What does leaving a test kit out in a hot, sunny day in the back of your truck every day, all summer, what does that do to a test kit? Well, it's a, it's a great question. It's one of the biggest problems that we see in the testing category in general is that people neglect them this way. Heat and humidity are the two enemies of accuracy with any kind of testing kit, whether it's test strips, test kits. Um, the reagents go bad. They have a finite shelf life and they go bad faster if you expose them to high heat and or high humidity. And so it's and or you don't have to have both like because because Phoenix has low humidity, but it's piping hot. Absolutely. Either one. High heat, okay. definitely uh, we see that a lot more often because people tend to leave them, the test kit, test strips in their truck, you know, in the front seat, leave it overnight, leave it in the shed next to the pool for the homeowners that are out there. Also a bad idea because it doesn't degrade right away, but over the course of a few weeks, that's all it takes for it to degrade to the point where you're not getting an accurate test result. So you need to keep those things in a cool, dark place, ideally, particularly if you're not going through them quick enough that you're, you know, you have them around for six, eight weeks or longer, and they're sitting in a humidity controlled, nice place in your house. That's, that's going to be your best bet for keeping accurate tests. So you kind of answered my second question. My first question is, tell me what kinds of test kits are affected by heat? I mean, is that all of them like electronic too? You know, electronic is less susceptible to it, but it certainly can have an impact, particularly if you're having to store them wet. Um, some of the reagent containers or some of those um, devices tell you to store it wet. And when it gets hot, you can have that evaporate off and then you lose it. And now it's out of calibration or it starts to rust. So it is important. You mean like the ones like with the blister pack for the reagent tabs or something or the discs? Or, or the electronics, the, the electronics themselves, you know, the where the sensor is, where the um, device sensor is. So, you know, not all of them are store dry. Some of them are store wet. So you got to make sure that you keep that solution in there. Okay. And so the second part of that question is what is the ideal way to store these? You had mentioned a climate controlled space, but if you're doing a route and you've got 60 pools a week, where do you store your test kit? 
So if you're doing a route and you've got 60 pools a week and you're going through those reagents in such a fashion that every couple of weeks you're replacing the reagents, it's not a big deal. You're going through them fast enough that you're probably going to be okay keeping them in your truck. If you're in there, you know, five, six weeks, that's when you need to start worrying about it. Even as, as few as four weeks, if it's a really hot temperature or you leave the lid open and they get now they're exposed to the humidity, that's when you run into problems. So you want to keep it sealed and you want to keep it ideally in a cool, dark place if you're going to be using it, you know, for four weeks, five weeks or longer before you go through your next test kit. And don't have more than one kit in your truck at a time. You know, buy the one you need, buy the reagents you need, and then get them fresh right when you need them next time. Or store them at, you know, the office, store them in your warehouse in a cool, dark place. You know, ideally somewhere inside where it's air conditioned. That's where you're going to get your your longest shelf life. Okay, so you said in the truck, not in the bed of the truck, directly exposed to <laughs> rain. And well, it's direct sunlight is what you want to try to avoid. Yes? Yeah, preferably direct sunlight and as, as little heat as possible. So that means not on your dashboard. I've I've seen that before. They leave it on their dashboard. Where I keep mine is under the back seat of my truck, totally in the shade. No sunlight gets to it. Maybe my truck gets hot during the day, but it's tucked under the seat. Would you say that that's an acceptable place? Probably. And it depends, again, on how hot it gets and the extent, how long that is exposed. So in Charlotte, where you're at, it's probably not a big deal. It's going to last you probably the full summer season. But just know it's not going to last much longer than that. So at the end of that season, you better get new reagents. That said, when I say neglecting test kits, I'm not just talking about leaving it in the sun. Yeah, that's a big one that almost everybody does. But I'm talking about, for examples, with strips, wet hands. I'll let you speak to that, Joe, because you know the test strip market better than I do. But I've seen people get their hand wet and then they'll reach in for a second strip and dribble water into that. Doesn't that ruin the rest of the strips? Yeah, it absolutely does. Probably quicker than anything else because you're putting that humidity directly into the bottle where it's going to prematurely contaminate those test strips. So, you know, as with, with with any reagent test kit, there's a real easy way to tell if that's happened. If you pull that strip out and it already looks discolored, if it looks like it's different color than what it should be when it's a dry reagent, it's been contaminated. Whether that's heat or humidity doesn't matter, but it's been contaminated. And if you dip that strip into the pool and it looks a lot lighter, it's just not developing the colors that are on that color chart that you're supposed to be comparing it to, again, contaminated probably go out and, and refresh. Pretty easy way to tell if, if you're getting contamination is just matching up those colors. So homeowners listening to this, if you're using test strips, make sure that you tilt the bottle on its side, right, Joe? And you just have a strip get pulled out of it rather than reaching in and pulling one out. Is that a fair description? Absolutely. Or dry your hand before you go in there. I mean, both. Yeah. Okay. And then when it comes to like a uh, color comparison, keep the vials clean. This isn't such a big deal for homeowners, but you'd be amazed at how dirty our hands get in the service trade. And I have seen some test vials that just look disgusting. They're greasy, they're dark, they're completely discolored. And you're supposed to look through that and determine if it matches a color. That is not going to work very well for you. So keep them clean. And if if you're a commercial operator listening to this, first of all, thank you. Um, But second of all, I see test kits in pump rooms that just get completely neglected. They just they leave them out, they dry, they have crusty, you know, there's scale deposits in the actual vials because they just let the water evaporate without rinsing them out. It's pretty wild what I see in these pump rooms. Um, There's one other type that, I guess these electronic test kits, calibrate them. Because if you don't calibrate them, right, Joe? I mean, if you don't calibrate them, they're pretty much guaranteed to fail you. Maybe that's an exaggeration. I don't know. You know better than I would. No, it, it absolutely is true. Nearly every electronic tester needs to be calibrated. There are very few of them that don't. We're probably talking about a temperature probe if it doesn't have to be calibrated. And how long in between calibrations depends probably on two things. The number of tests that you're doing in between those rounds. And then number two, what the manufacturer's recommendation is. So if it's you know every thousand tests or every ninety days, you know you should be calibrating that thing pretty often. Some of them require calibration every thirty days, so you know having the appropriate calibration solutions on hand is very important. I would recommend having the calibration solutions for that particular instrument. So if if your instrument is made by one manufacturer, buy the reagents that are made by that manufacturer as well. It's going to make it easier to calibrate 
and a lot of those are self-recognition. So they'll recognize the calibration solution. So it just makes it easier. Right. Thank you, Joe. So in summary, take care of your test kit because it it really is going to drive a lot of your decision-making on how to treat those pools. So now, uh, unless there's anything you wanted to add. I'll just add a couple more things on the, the testing. You know, one of the important things when you're using any kind of liquid test is the drop size. And that's a critical step. And a lot of people overlook the size of the drop. And, you know, if you're getting a drop that's too small or one that's too large because you've got dirty tips or you leave the caps off and it gets, you know, it builds up, uh, the reagent builds up there and crystallizes, keep those things clean. It might mean just wiping them off. It might mean actually taking a a little bit of force and wiping it off, but make sure that you keep those caps on, keep them clean and make sure that you're getting the right drop size because that's also important. And then the last thing that I'll mention, kind of going back to what Eric said about the comparators, when you're doing a test and you're taking that comparator out to the pool, rinse it with the pool water that you're going to be testing a couple times before you do the actual test. It's just going to get off, you know, some of the, any residual that's on there, it's going to equilibrate to the pool that's there. If there's any chlorine demand on your tubes, it's going to take care of that. So just make sure that you give it a couple of rinses with the water that you're going to be testing and it'll just help you get a little bit accurate, a little bit more accurate with your testing. Thank you. That's all valuable. So. Um, let's move on to the next habit. This is the number two biggest habit and, um, it's chasing pH. And I don't know why people chase pH so much, except that I'm going to blame the textbooks because we have been told so many things that we have to have this range of pH of seven, four to seven, six, or at the lowest 7.2 at the highest 7.8. The problem is physics disagrees with that. So you can try to keep your pH in that range. That doesn't mean it's possible. But what we want to do instead of trying to control pH is we want to contain it. We want to set a low point for where we're going to aim to correct our pH every time we treat that pool. Let's say that is 7.5, maybe 7.6, depending on the circumstances of where you are and the temperature at that time. You can expect unless you're using trichlor, which is an acidic chlorine, you can expect that pH to rise over the course of a week. How much depends on your carbon and alkalinity and some other factors like aeration. Maybe if you have a vanishing edge pool, um, you're going to have more aeration, which means your pH is going to climb faster. But we shouldn't be trying to fight physics on that. A much more affordable strategy is to expect it, embrace it, and let it happen. What we want to do is we want to contain pH with a floor of, say, 7.5 to 7.6, and a ceiling, thanks to Henry's law of the solubility of gases, is going to be about 8.2, depending on your carbon and alkalinity. So we already know where the floor and ceiling are. Who cares what the pH is in between? And before you say, oh, wait, hey, pH controls the strength of chlorine, it does if there's zero cyanuric acid in your pool. We made mention of this in that earlier episode about pH, uh, albeit briefly. Cyanuric acid controls the strength of your chlorine. So if you are adjusting your pH because you need a lower pH so that chlorine works well and you have CYA in your pool, you're kind of wasting your time because there isn't really that much of a difference in chlorine strength in terms of the percentage of hypochlorous acid. There isn't much difference between 70 pH and 8.5. It's almost negligible. You're both under 3%. Now, Joe, when you've been in backyards, how often have you seen problems with, I don't know, evidence of a bouncing pH or they use a lot of bicarb or anything like that? Have you been to a lot of pools like that? I've been to a few. Um, You know, typically there's not a, a big bouncing problem. There tends to be one side or the other, and you can usually figure out what the factor is driving that. You know, it's hard to understand pH. And, you know, if you're like me growing up, you figure out pretty quickly that people tell you if it's above 7.8, you should be worried that it can be scale forming, that it can be bad. And, you know, if you look at the LSI and you take into consideration Henry's law, you know that you can be above 7.8 and and at least, you know, temporarily, and you don't have to be as concerned about it. So, you know, that, that really for me was the big takeaway in listening to this whole thing. So in summary, don't try to control pH, contain it, set it to a set point, frame your LSI parameters like calcium and alkalinity around what you're trying to do. 
and you will have a contained pH and you just set it down and it's going to rise up to the limit. And then you set it down again and it's going to rise up again. It's very predictable. It's very controllable because you're not worried about chlorine strength. Now, every third or fourth treatment, you'll have to add a little bit of bicarb to replace the alkalinity. That's normal, but you don't have to do it every week. And this is going to save you a lot of money because bicarbon acid are not free. And the more pools you have, it adds up. We got one company that has about 300 pools on service. They saved over five grand in one summer on acid and bicarb alone that they just didn't have to buy. That's amazing. That's really good. And you know what the biggest thing they did was? They put calcium levels up to 400 plus on all of their pools. That's what they did. They stabilized their LSI. They were using the Arenda app. So it can be done. Have faith in it. Calcium is your friend. Anything you want to add to that, Joe, before we get to the number one bad habit? No, I think it, it seems pretty simple. And you think about the pH and the calcium, and I think people get scared by it. And listening to this, hopefully you're taking that into consideration and understand that they can be your friend. They work together. So there you go. Uh, if you have more questions on that, by the way, we have tons of articles published and videos galore. So take Arenda Academy Four Pillars. Trust me, it'll, it'll make more sense when you kind of visualize it. Okay, number one habit, and then we will wrap this episode up. Joe, what do you think the biggest problem that you've seen around the country is that is just an epidemic problem in the industry that people do? I think, you know, it, it might be related to your number one topic, but it's just going too fast. You know, it's it's just not taking the time to to really do it well, which will save you time in the next step, in the next process. You know, it, if you just if you do it right the first time, you're going to spend a lot less time maintaining, you know, making the the adjustments to get it back into range. And so I, I just saw that people tended to do it too fast. Hey, I like that. That's that's a little more general than this specific thing, but it absolutely describes why this is a problem. And the number one problem is abusing acid, specifically muriatic acid. Joe, I'm going to give you the pick. Which one do you want to cover first? How to pour, how to dose, or how to measure? I think because the problem that I see the most is how to pour. Start there. Okay. How to pour. Because the density is so high, it's very simple. Dilute it. I don't care if you're trying to lower alkalinity or pH or both or one or the other. It doesn't matter. Alkalinity is a linear measurement. It doesn't matter how you add acid. Always, always, always dilute your acid. And always, always acid to water, never water to acid. Oh, yes. Thank you. Always add chemicals, no matter what it is, to water, not, yeah, don't do water to acid. And don't add chlorine anywhere near where you're doing that in the short term because the fumes can be harmful too. Dilute your acid, pour around the perimeter with circulation running. Okay, now that's how to pour it. Dosing it is as easy as knowing the volume of your pool correctly and testing water correctly and using the app. No math required. You can use the Arenda app. It'll tell you within fractions of an ounce exactly how much acid you need. And I asked this question around the country. You've probably heard it before. I know Joe's heard it, but a typical 20,000 gallon pool, if you get there and the pH is 8.0 and you want to lower it to 7.5, how much acid does that take? And when we asked that around the country, and I mean the vast majority, like 99% of the people we've asked, say it's about a half gallon, sometimes it's three quarters of a gallon, sometimes it's a gallon of muriatic acid. And the real answer is it's about a quart. That's half of what almost everyone thinks. So Joe, if I do double the amount of acid to make a pH correction, what's going to happen to my chemistry? Well, you're going to have problems with it. You're going to drop well below where your target is. You're going to be playing catch, catch up with that. And it's probably going to have an impact on other parameters. How about a pH rebound? How about etching? How about I think I'm going to 7.5. I'm really going to 6.7. What does that do to the LSI? You know, you, you put that into the Arenda app and you see, oh my God, that's devastating. And of course, you're going to etch and you're going to get a spike pH. And in fact, it's kind of like a rubber band. The further lower you get away from the pH ceiling, the faster the pH rebounds. So you got to know how to dose it, which means you have to know the volume of your pool. If you're off by a few thousand gallons, you're going to be off by several ounces of acid. And that sounds like nothing, but it is actually a pretty big deal, especially over time. So measure correctly. Don't neglect, sorry, don't neglect your test kit. So you have an accurate reading, 
use the app, use the correct volume, dosing will be a cinch. Anything you want to add to that, Joe? I think that sums that up. Yeah, good. I was trying to be cogent because we, we talked a lot about the neglecting <laughs> test kits thing, but they all of these things tie together, as you can tell. Finally, how to actually measure it. It's very simple. Use a measuring cup. So how do we create this habit? Measuring cups are self-explanatory. The real question is, how do you get your guys on your route if you are a business owner or if you personally have your own pool route? How do you get them to remember to do it? Well, here's how I do it. I recommend taking a clean bucket. Every pool guy should have a clean bucket, at least one in their truck to mix every chemical. Every dry chemical needs to be pre-diluted. Acid needs to be pre-diluted. So you got a bucket anyway. Put the acid gallon in the bucket with the measuring cup and a set of gloves and carry that into the backyard when you go in there. So the bucket's going to remind you, oh yeah, I got to dilute this stuff. The measuring cup is right there. Perfect. And you have the gloves. Now I know a lot of pool professionals don't wear gloves. You know, if you get a little bit on your hand, they rinse it off. That is definitely not a best practice. And if you're not in the trade, I strongly recommend you wear gloves. I wear gloves when I deal with acid. It hurts a lot. It'll burn right through your skin uh, given enough time. So definitely do the right thing. Best practice, wear your protective gear. I recommend glasses too. I'm always, always wearing sunglasses anyway, so that's not a big deal, but wear gloves. So measure the amount of acid, put it in a bucket of water to dilute it, pour it around the perimeter. It's that simple. The problems that we see, I mean, Joe, I know you're new to Arenda within the last few months. Do you get a lot of helpline phone calls yet? Or are they Just mostly coming to me and Jared? Just a few. Okay. Has anybody called you about plaster issues or um, challenges holding alkalinity? I have. I've talked to a couple of people about that actually. Really? So in your just a few months here, you're already hearing it. I can comfortably say in the last four years, well over 80% of the problems that people call Arenda about, in my experience, have to do with this problem. And it, it boils down to abuse of acid. I, a perfect example was a plasterer called me and they had a scale problem. The problem was it was scale in certain spots on the bottom of the pool, suspiciously about an arm's length around the perimeter of the pool. How did that happen? Scale doesn't form down there, but it did. And they had this up close photo with an underwater camera of scale that had grown on top of the pebbles of the surface, but yet the cement was etched around all the pebbles, which told me there was aggressive water, but then scale formed. Well, it makes perfect sense. Acid dropped down to the bottom, etched the cement, which has a very high pH, which neutralizes most of the acid. Now you have a high pH right there and you locally have an LSI violation as a result of a rebound. That's what this problem can lead to. You can have fading liners. You can have destroyed gel coats on your fiberglass pools that start turning white when chlorine starts oxidizing the gel coat once it's deteriorated. All of these issues, I mean, we hear so many plaster problems that just have to do with abuse of acid. So that being said, uh, Joe, is there anything you want to end on here before we wrap up? Yeah, I think it's just reiterating something that you said, Eric, and and that is that as a service guy in particular, if you overdose on acid, when you come back to the pool the next week, you might not even know it if you didn't measure that acid out correctly. So you could have overdosed it and you come back to the same problem that you would have come back to anyways, a pH of 8.0 or 8.2. And you have this recurring problem where you're adding more acid than you need to because you don't realize that you didn't have to have that much in the first place. So, you know, measuring that out. Yeah. Not only are you spending extra on acid, you're taking twice the alkalinity out that you were supposed to. So you're going to have to buy more bicarb too. You're going to have to add that. So it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of problems. Um, anyway, well, let's wrap it up because people are getting bored. We, we have short attention spans ourselves. <laughs> this has been, this has been great, Joe. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm Eric Knight with Arenda. That's Joe Swayze with Arenda. Uh, if you have any questions or comments and you have pool chemistry issues, comment in the YouTube links below. If you're listening to this on the audio, hit us up on social media, Arenda Tech. We're all over Facebook and Instagram. We're, we're not hard to find. You can get the Arenda app. It's just called Orenda, O-R-E-N-D-A. It's a free app. You can contact us through the app. There's a link in the menu. Contact us. Fill out a form. Request a training. We'd love to hear from you. So if you do have these questions, we're happy to talk to you. Uh, this has been episode 10 
of the Rule Your Pool podcast. Hopefully we have brought clarity to these issues and uh, you're able to bring clarity to your water. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you for listening to Rule Your Pool, a podcast by Arenda Technologies. For more information on what we discussed in this week's episode, check the links in the description or visit www.orendatech.com. I hope you find this show valuable enough that you tap that subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can also like us on Facebook and social media. And with our help, you'll be able to rule your pool without over-treating it with chemicals and wasting money. I'll see you next episode.